So I'll be talking today, and I'm super excited to get to be here with you. Um, I kind of wanted to just jump into when I was a kid, and mom would take me to the grocery store, because that was rare. Because now that you have kids, you might understand like why you did not take, right? <laughs> she didn't take me to the grocery store. I get it now. Um, but everyone else, she'd take me to the grocery store, and there would be one aisle. Sometimes it was the cereal, very seldom. She was very funny about me having grand plates. Um, but sometimes it was the cereal aisle, sometimes it was the cookie aisle, sometimes it was the chip aisle. But there would be this point where she would say, you can pick out one thing, right? You can get what you want, right? And you live for those moments. I know when, our, when we travel, when we do long road trips, my kids, you'd think they'd be excited to see their cousins if we're going somewhere or on vacation. They're always like, are we going to stop at the gas station? we pick out whatever we want <laughs> because that is one of the treats we just kind of do as kind of our family tradition is they're able to get one drink and one whatever treat they want and so today as we're about to go into the scriptures i'm just going to let you know we're really just going to look at a story in the bible and i'm going to encourage you to sort of do exactly what my kids do on those trips i want you to pick out what god is specifically saying to you because there's not an overall necessarily point in this there kind of a lot of points, and I just felt like this is where God wanted us to be today. So I kind of want you to jump in with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. If you, if you don't know me at all, one of the things you learn very quickly is I love Elijah and Elisha. They're like, they're kind of the guys that I just love. If I'm having a dry spell in my time of reading, you know, the Bible, and I'm like, hey, I can go into my story. My favorite story is like a safe walker for me. I go into Elijah and Elisha stories because there's just adventure and there's just exciting things that we get to see how big God is in so many different ways. So today we're in one of those. Woohoo! And we're going to be talking about Elisha. And he's the, he's the second guy. Elijah, Elisha. He's the guy that followed Elijah. So we're in this story and I just want to jump in because I think. One of the times that you've been here every once in a while, I spoke recently on the first part of chapter four, but we're going to hit the second part of chapter four now. So if you'll join me, we're in 2 Kings chapter four, and we're going to start in verse eight. You guys good? Let's see if I get everything that will stay here on the podium. We're good. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, and a well-to-do woman was there. Is it a different one? Yeah, okay. And a well-to-do woman was there who urged him to stay for a meal. So whenever he came by, he stopped there to eat. She said to her husband, I know that this man who often comes our way is a holy man of God. Let's make a small room on the roof and put it in a bed, put in it a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp for him. Then he can stay there whenever he comes to us. We're going to stop for just a second. Let's kind of wrap our minds around the scenario here. So here's a woman and well-to-do. So she's kind of got some money. She's a wealthy woman, got a decent house, got her life nicely planned in front of her. And she notices Elijah passes through town. Well, the prophets oftentimes kind of were travelers because they were to be what spoke of God and how people heard from God. So in that, they kind of needed to get around because they didn't have the scripture written out in a whole bunch of copies so everybody could have it. So this prophet represented hearing from and speaking to God, exactly what we talk about in gathering. That's what a prophet represented. So they had to get around, okay? And so as, as Elijah would travel through Shunem, the town of Shunem, this woman took note of that. She noticed. And she said, you know what? I'm going to start inviting him over for dinner. That's a nice thing to do. And so she began to have him over for dinner. And then we keep reading in that story, right? And it says there's this point where she says, I see this truly is the man of God. And in that space, she says to her husband, let's make a room for him. And so we introduce this whole story with the cool thing that this woman, when she got and recognize the presence of God, she made it a priority. She said, I'm going to build a house, or a part of my house, I'm going to build an addition. Now, I don't know if any of you have done any reno <laughs> in your house, but if you have, I'm pretty sure you can attest to this. It's going to require inconvenience, it's going to require some rearranging, and it's going to require some resources. 
So to make God a priority in her house, she had to rearrange, didn't she? She had to be a little inconvenienced, and there was going to be some resources that were going to have to put out, put out to make this room. And I don't know if you've ever been around church for a long time, or an old Southern church, they call that the prophet's chamber. There's always like a room in the space, or maybe a little apartment that the church has to help like if missionaries are traveling through, or, or different guest speakers come in. They call it the prophet's chamber. Boom, this is where it came from. You always wonder, what in the world was that? It comes from this story, because she literally said, I'm going to make room just for Elisha. Nobody else went in there. Okay? So let's keep going and let's move on to see what else we can pick up. One day, when Elisha, we're in verse 11, came, he went up to his room and lay down there. He said to the servant Gehazi, that's his servant, okay, <coughs> travels with him, kind of his personal assistant, we shall say, called the Shunammite woman. So he called her and she stood before him. Elisha said to him, tell her, which I, I always think this part of the story is fun, because like, here's the woman sitting there, and he looks at Gehazi and says, tell her, like, what in the world, Elisha? Okay. Tell her, you have gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can be done for you? Can we speak on your behalf to the king or the commander of the army? And she replied, I have a home among my own people. We're going to stop there for a second because here's the thing. When you make God a priority in your house, look, she was content. She didn't have any need. In fact, Elijah looks around and says, she's got everything. What, what does she need? And so there's a contentment that comes when God is placed as priority in your house. Let's keep reading. What can be done for her, Elijah asked. The Haggai said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. Now, I don't know which part was the problem here. I don't know what Gehazi was saying. Give her a son, replace the husband. I don't know. But Gehazi says, so she does have some problems, okay, Elijah? She doesn't have any kids. And there's no potential for there to be any future children. And so there's a kind of a problem. Apparently, the woman said in contentment. She never brought that up, right? So what's going on there? Maybe we'll find out later. What can be done for her, Elijah? As Gehazi said, well, she has no son and her husband is old. We're in verse 15. Then Elisha said, call her. So he called her and she stood in the doorway. About this time next year, Elisha said, you will hold a son in your arms. No, my lord, she replied, don't mislead your servant, O man of God. Verse 17, one of my favorites of this passage. But the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elijah had told her. So she kind of has this miracle baby. She's put God as a priority, and miracles come into her home. I mean, it's kind of like, oh, all is well. It's a good story today. And so we keep going because there's more to her story. There's more to life than all the good, right? Even when we do all the right things, she's, she's doing all the right things, right? Even then, other things happen. It's not all good. Let's keep reading. The child grew, verse 18, the child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers. My head, my head, he said to his father. His father told a servant, carry him in to his mother. After the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon. And then, everybody, he died. Okay. So, doing all the right stuff. Made God a priority. Got to see a miracle. Woo! What do you do when your miracle dies? Because that's what just happened to her. All these dreams that she didn't even know she had in this child, and it's gone. Is God, is God mad at her? Is God not present? Is God not good? What in the world? See, we know, we have answered, if you have been at all identified as a person of faith in any realm, and there ever becomes a conversation about faith, eventually somebody will always ask, right? Why do bad things happen 
we get a few more blah 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 blah, right? We've all had that question so many times. And see, it's really hard to say because people don't always like the answer, but the truth is, world is broken. World is broken. We live in a broken world. It's always, there's, it's junk always happening. It's broken. And so, it's not about if she's done the right thing here or not done the right thing. You see, the promise that God gives us is that he never leaves us, never forsakes us. See, the presence of God was still in our house. The presence of God was still in our house. She still had the room for God. It was still there. So what happens when your miracle dies? What happens when the bad thing happened if you've been a good person? What happens then? Well, let's keep reading. Let's see what else we can kind of pick out from the gas station here and see what we can take home with us. Okay, we're in verse 21. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and went out. Now understand that this room represents the presence of God to her. When she saw Elisha, she just saw, hey, God, this, this guy works for God. This is like a direct report to God, okay? So that was not normal. We didn't have Jesus Christ yet, okay? We're not living in New Testament times where all of us have access to God. She sees Elijah, she's, it's like an equal sign. Elijah equals God to her, okay? Not that he was God, but there was an extreme connection. So when she took her dead miracle and she went, and where did she put it? In the presence of God. That's where she put it. <coughs> that is a huge thing. You guys, you know, you have been disappointed. And you have been in the bottom, woo, and in that just worst part of your life. The worst days. And in those worst days, where did she go? Immediately. To the presence of God. That's where she went. And let's see, let's keep reading, let's see what else we can glean, what we can pick up from her. She called her husband, verse 22, she called her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and a donkey so I can go to the man of God quickly and return. Here's the truth. Quickly, watch, watch later how she says that, okay? Why go to him today? Her husband asked. It's not the new moon or the Sabbath. <laughs> Why are you going to spend time with God? I mean, you go to church. That should be enough. You want the presence of God on a daily, consistent, priority in your house moment? Because disappointments don't wait till Sunday. Because miracles die on Monday. And miracles die on Tuesday and Wednesday, and, and dreams, and things you thought, the way things were going to work out, die all through the week. And so you've got to have a space in your house where you can meet with the presence of God, because it's coming, right? Now she says, she says, I'm going to go, I'm going to make sure I get in God's presence. Let's keep reading. It's all right, she said. I love that. You know what that actually is in Hebrew? It's just shalom, peace, peace. See, when I get in these situations, I make, I call them, <laughs> we were talking about this this week, I, make, I call them panic plans. <laughs> it's like, okay, worst case scenario, worst case scenario, let's play this out. What, 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 what do I do? What do I do? What do I do, right? I don't even get as far as she is. I haven't even buried the kid, right? I haven't even seen the death, and I'm still making worst case panic plans. Panic plans. <laughs> Here's the thing. I love that she says peace. Man, what's your peace? Her peace plan was to go to God. And peace. She sat on the donkey, verse 24, and said to her servants, lead on. Don't slow down for me unless I tell you. Man, all throughout this passage, you're going to see words for speed. Here's, a, here's another truth. Ready to take it out of the gas station shelf? Here's the other truth. When we recognize death in those around us, it creates urgency. When we know, hey, there's been a death, there's death in this world, when we get that, we don't slow down for anything. Lead on. Don't slow down. Look, when we get that that person in your office that you crack jokes with,
this all the time, and it's hysterical. When we get that there's a death coming, and it's eternal, and there's no escape, unless they meet Jesus Christ. Boy, there's an urgency to that space. You see, when you recognize death in those around you, you get it. It's not like, ah, they're going to go find Elisha. Is somebody going to come? No. She has a plan, right? Peace plan. Get to God. Get to God. Get to God. And guess what? Urgency. Because there's death. I've got to get to God because there's death around me. And the only answer is God. Let's keep reading. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When he saw her in the distance, the man of God said to his servant Gehazi, Look, there's the Shunammite. Run in to meet her and ask her, Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? What's her response? Everything is all right. Guess what that is? Again, peace. That's crazy, right? She says peace. You know what? I think sometimes, I think, we can say, what, is she faking it? Is she just, you know, like we all do, you know, brave things like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, really, I'm fine. Or is she speaking? Is she speaking over her situation peace? Is she saying, I believe God for peace in this situation? You know what? There's an old phrase that says, fake it till you make it. And I think we need to change that as people of God, to faith it till we make it. There's a lot to be said for speaking peace over a situation that just looks tragic. Speak peace. Peace. Not because I've got a plan, because my only plan is my peace plan to get to God. I speak peace because I know the Prince of Peace. I speak peace over the tragic, the deaths of my miracle, my disappointment, the way I thought this was going to go. It's obvious this is not going to go that way, but I speak peace. And that is faithing it till we make it. And I'm telling you, as people of God, that's the only way we do make it. You see what I'm saying? Because I can let the whirlwind happen to me. I'm spinning like the rest of the world. Or I can step out, step out in faith, rise above, and speak peace <coughs> to the very storm that others are also experiencing. Do you understand? It wasn't just her that was experiencing this. Her husband didn't even know he lost his son. Let's keep moving. When she reached the man of God at the mountain, she took hold of his feet. No better place to be than the feet of God taking your trouble. Gehazi came over, because there's always one of these, to push her away. <laughs> always going to be one of those. But the man of God said, leave her alone. God speaks that over you. You stay right where you are. You stay at my feet, Mary, right? Instead of being a Martha, you stay where you are. You, you want to err? You want to make a mistake? You err on the side of faith. You want to make a mistake? Don't act. Sit at God's feet. Well, maybe I should have acted. Well, you made the error sitting at God's feet. I think you're going to be all right. You understand? She is in bitter distress. And I love this. This is one of those, like, just take this off the gas station shelf if it speaks to you. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. You know, when I first read this, it spoke to me because Elisha was used to getting revelations from God and hearing, oh, this is what that person wants, and oh, this is why this person is here. And this woman comes up, she's grabbing over his feet, and she's, he's like, I don't know what this is about. And when I do, when I get a situation like that with God, when I've been asking God, hey, what's going on? And God's not speaking, I'm like, what, what am I doing wrong? God doesn't love me. There's a problem. I sinned, confessing everything. Lord, I, I kind of feel bad about that yesterday and walked out in front of this. Hey, Lord, forgive me. Because I'm trying to get it right, right? Elijah's like, you know what? He believes there's a plan for revelation and it does not affect his position with God. He's like, okay, 
God's going to reveal it in his time. And this isn't just about me, and I'm okay. He was so secure in his position with God that he believed that there was a plan for revelation that had not yet happened. Boy, some of us need that today, don't we? I'm sorry. What does God want for my life? What does God want for my life? You know what? This isn't about you. You are still a child of God. Your position has not been altered. Have the faith to just wait. It's hard when it's us, right? We're talking about a death here. We're talking about a death. And Elisha <coughs> waited for God to reveal. Verse 28. Boy, here is, whew, this is one of those points in the story. Verse 28. Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Didn't I tell you, don't raise my hopes? You know, some of us might say, well, she has lost some of faith. She's been faith in it to me. No, she took her questions to God. She didn't have to spread it around to all her friends. She didn't have to get her husband all worked up on her behalf. She took it to God. Why not? He's the one who can actually do something about it. She says, did I even ask for this? Did I even ask for a kid? This is why I didn't ask for a kid. Now, this is a good takeaway. You ready to get this off the gas station shelf? What's your big ask that you're not willing to ask God for because you don't want to risk disappointment? It's one thing to say, you know what? When she puts on this prayer in the house, prayers that she didn't even pray got answered. Woohoo! Let's back up. She didn't have the faith to ask because she was afraid to risk disappointment. Boy, there's not a person in here, I would guarantee you, that's not had that experience. I can't even ask God for that. If I'm even on speaking terms with God, I wouldn't ask God for that because I'm going to be disappointed. What if God's not real? What if he doesn't talk to me? What if I don't hear from him? What does that mean? Because everybody else thinks they can hear from God. So if I talk to him and he doesn't answer me, then what does that say about me? What's your big ask? What dream have you put on hold from even asking God for that? Even in the the quiet? Your big ask. She had to walk through. Hey, I didn't even ask for this. I didn't want to be disappointed. How big is God? That even on the other side of disappointment, even on the other side when your miracles die, He's letting her grab the feet, right? Bring the questions here. Peace, peace. I'll speak it over my situation, but I know who to go to with the hurt. Let's keep reading. Verse 20, Elisha said to Gehazi, Tuck your cloak into your belt. Take my staff in your hand and run. If you meet anyone, do not greet them. And if anyone greets you, do not answer. Lay my staff on the boy's face. In other words, again, speak. Urgency. As soon as she said what she said, Elisha knew, right? The revelation of the Lord came, and he said, Death, urgency. Hey, guys, we say every week, Ever widen circles? Why do you think we say that? We believe that the Holy Spirit life lives inside of us, and it needs to emanate out because there is death in this world. So hence, there should be an urgency in all of us to propel the kingdom forward. That's what Elisha says here. He tells that to Gehazi, but the child's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. I love this. So he got up and followed her. Elijah was like, okay, I'm going to send Gehazi. And the woman was like, hey, I'm not leaving you. We're doing this together. You know what? There's a lot of truth to be said for that. Because some of us need to leave our disappointment in the chamber with God and then go and run and find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, If you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with your whole heart. There's a lot of us who need to leave some disappointment back in the chamber and go out and meet with God. 
go out and find God. If you seek me, you will find me. That is a promise that needs to echo throughout your mind, in the cavity of your life, in the hallways of your decisions. If I seek God, I will find him. If I seek him with my, once again, priority of the house. We can't forget where this story started. She set God as a priority in her home. And it's shaping and shifting and, and moving this story forward. Let's keep going. The Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the boy's face, but there was no sound or response. So Gehazi went back to meet Elisha and told him, the boy has not awakened. When Elisha reached the house, first of all, let's just say, not every story is recorded, and I have to think, it's like they've done this before, right? Hey, I did what we did last time, and it's not working this time. You know, because he was just way too knowledgeable about this, okay? <laughs> Verse 12, when Elisha reached the house, there was the boy lying dead on his couch. He went in, shut the door on the two of them, and what's the first word? And prayed to the Lord. Then he got on the bed and lay upon the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands, as he stretched himself out upon him. This kind of just represents life to life. The boy's body grew warm. What, what does a lot to be said for just laying with people, for just living your life in front of people, for just letting your life energy even emanate from you and let them experience that? There's a lot to be said for that. Elisha turned away and walked back and forth in the room and then got on the bed and stretched out upon him once more. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. He prays to God. God answers the prayer, the boy lives. Good thing she went to God with it, isn't it? It's a good thing she didn't just hang out with the servants and have them run and try to find somebody to help them. It's a good thing she didn't just panic to her husband. It's a good thing she didn't make her own plans about how she was going to revive this child. It's a good thing her peace plan said, I'm going to get at the feet of God. I'm going to take this to who can fix this. That's exactly what happened. God fixed it. Elisha summoned the Hazel and said, Call the Shunammite. And he did. And when she came, he said, Take your son. She came and fell at his feet and bowed to the ground. Then she took her son and went out. Now, this is such a fun part of the story, right? Because your disappointment, those dry bones like in Ezekiel's dream, those dry bones, the Lord can breathe life back into it. And that's true. And that's awesome. And that's a hooray. But the cool part about this story hasn't even happened yet. Her worst day, her dead dream day, that place, it's not done. Her life's not done. She still has more adventures to be had. You know what? That's important to remember. Your worst day, there's life after that. And her life after that includes more stuff, ups and downs. And the cool thing about it is, this woman doesn't even have a name in the Bible. I mean, we don't, we don't even know it. And yet, we get a lot of her life. We're going to jump into chapter 8. Flip over to chapter 8 in 2 Kings. Chapter 8. Because things happen. Elijah continues on his life. The room is still occupied. When Elijah comes through Shunem, he's still hanging out with the Shunemite woman. He's getting to watch this little boy grow up. This little boy become older and older, and some years pass, and come into chapter 8. Now, Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, oh, she's back. This is her story. It continues. God's still priority of the house, so her adventure with God is not done. Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. Okay, famine's coming. Guess what? Does she have to worry about the famine coming? Guys, did she have to worry about the famine coming? No, she didn't even know the famine was coming, but God prepared already a peace plan in front of her that included getting out from under the famine. Elijah said, hey, trouble's coming. You need to kind of step aside over this way to avoid this trouble. Some trouble comes at us, right? God doesn't push aside every trouble. Her son died. What 
then there's some trouble. He does push aside, okay? You follow? And because God's the priority in the house, she has access to God, and she's able to get those revelations. Let's keep reading. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said, and she and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines. How many years? Seven years. Well, guess what happened? Within that seven-year time, people kind of took over her land. The house sat vacant. It's not the same as it is now. The house sat vacant. People said, great. That's my property, too, and I'm going to start trying to use that farm, and I'm going to do what I can do there. And so her land goes away. At the end of the seven years, verse 3, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to the king to beg for her house and land. Make a ruling on this. The king was talking to Gehazi. What? What? The king was talking to who? Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. And had said, this is what the king has said, are you ready? Stay, stick with me, because this part of the shelf of the gas station is pretty cool, okay? And had said, tell me about all the great things Elisha has done. Verse 5, the first three words, ready? Just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to beg the king for a house and land. What? What? And see, if you haven't walked with God, you're going to say, Psh, did that really happen? Psh, that's a coincidence, right? But if you've been walking with God, and if you have God as a priority, you're like, yep, that's the way it is. <laughs> that is the way it is. Everybody around you will say, that. what a great coincidence. And you're like, nope. It's not a coincidence. I walk with the sovereign God, and he makes things happen. So here's this woman, she comes in to ask the king, and in the moment that the king is talking to Gehazi and says, tell me some of the great things. Hey, don't you think that was a common thing? Israel, Israel at that time is a very much a storytelling people, right? So he's like, hey, tell me some stories, right? And Gehazi begins to tell the story of the woman whose son died. And in that moment, she walks in to ask for something. Hmm. Interesting. Let's be reading. Gehazi said, This is the woman, my lord the king, and this is her son, whom Elijah restored to life. It's like, I'm telling this great story, this testimony, and all of a sudden, like, the doctor that declare that this disease to be gone just walks in at that moment. Hey, I was not a doctor. And then with him is the nurse. I saw her come back to life on the operating table. I mean, this is what's happening. I mean, that's crazy. The king asked the woman about it. So now she gets to tell him. Here, you guys, let's just stop there. Your worst day, if you put it in the presence of God and you live in those peace plans, whether God brings life specifically to that dream or not, there's a chapter 8. There's somebody else who's going to need your worst day story to build their faith. There's somebody else who's looking to hear of God's life in death. Your worst case scenario day is somebody else's faith day. Isn't that cool? And it's already been prepared. Doesn't that give you perspective? You're working through this, and, and you know, people are saying, well, there's got to be a reason for it. There's no reason for junk in your life. It's a sin world. It is a broken world. Okay, God's not like, I will now make this horrible thing happen to you so that there's a reason. No. He says, give me everything, and I'll work it together for good. You see the difference? Yeah. Junk's going to happen. Good things are going to happen. It's going to happen. Give it to me, and I'll make great things happen. Cool, right? Her worst day, King's faith day. That's powerful. Who in your life, who in your life needs to hear what your worst day has been? Who in your life needs to hear the restoration power of God in your life, where he took your death and he made life out of it? Who needs to hear that? God 
God's prepared a place for it. God's prepared. He already prepared the king. He already said the avenue, the path was straight right there. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, and this is the cool part, give back everything that belongs to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. So whoever had this land, maybe it had been in the king's possession, whatever the case was, she got the land restored. Man, your worst day, you think, man, this is the worst thing that could ever happen. God's going to use that to bring restoration later. God's going to use your worst case day, that horrible day, and he's bringing restoration. And there's a bigger plan. And the key, the key, what started this whole story? <coughs> What started this whole story? She quit just having dinner with God, Sunday dinner. And she said, I'm going to make him a priority in my whole house. That's what started her life adventure. Isn't that cool? Some of us struggle so hard. We struggle so hard to give our resources to God as if he doesn't own the cattle on a thousand hills. We struggle so hard to be inconvenienced. Man, I don't want to be inconvenienced. I don't want to go serve. I don't want to go do that. We struggle so hard against that. Some of us struggle so hard against just rearranging our life and really making room for God. And we fight that and we say, well, I just don't have time. I try, I try to get more. I just don't have time. Everything in her life was propelled from giving God time. Everything in her life was propelled from a place of giving her resources to God. Everything in her life was propelled, and let's just simplify it, from making God a priority. You know, Blake started off this year with that message about priority. If you haven't watched it, I think it was the second week of January. And he talks about priority. Look, why do you think we start off that whole year with that? That truly propelled your entire life. Walk with God to have these adventures. So there is chapter 8 after the death of dreams. So there's more to your story than just the junk. You tired of the junk? Well, guess what? God redeems the junk. When you make him a priority, when you take it to him, he redeems the junk. He makes it full of faith. Not her faith. She was just like us. You saw her. She was just like us. She had questions. She took them to God's feet and did that sound like a happy camper? Did that sound like somebody full of faith? She was afraid. She was upset. She was angry. But she knew where to take it. She took it to God. And in that space, there was healing. And in that space, God redeems the children. Let's pray.